This is the Yanks Go Yard Podcast with Adam Weinrib and Thomas Carinante. Good afternoon. Welcome into the Yanks Go Yard Podcast. I'm Adam Weinrib alongside Thomas Carinante. We haven't done this in a while. The New York Yankees have won another series. They have won their fifth straight series to begin the year, but this one ended with a multi-part thud that made it kind of feel like a loss. It was definitely a bad game, bad L, not the kind of L you want to take. Sort of reminiscent of bad losses in previous years. If you want a spiral, you're allowed. You're allowed one April spiral. I'll give it to you. But uh, rationally, had to play a doubleheader in windy Cleveland on Saturday. Cody Poteet in the nightcap. Pitching strapped, Luis Heel moved to the next series, all sorts of things boating very poorly, and they managed to sweep the doubleheader. Yes, some of the good was offset a little bit by the antics of the next day, but overall, five series in a row, uh, that's the best start to the season possible, unless you wanted them to sweep every game. If you wanted them to be 16-0, I'm very sorry, but 12-4, and really, really pretty good. Uh, they were, I think, 21-8 and eight in 2022 when we all sort of felt like, okay, I've never seen any dominance like this early in the season. And in order to get there, they would just have to go 9-4 and four over the next stretch of games. And that also seems kind of possible. Uh, schedule not easy. They have not played. Uh, Marlins are the only bad team they've played so far this year. And they're 12-4. and four. And they play some more pretty good teams coming up. They, they go to the Brewers. They go to the Orioles eventually. Uh, they do get the A's for four at home next week, but the A's are seven and nine, and the A's are ahead of the Astros in the division. So respect my A's, respect my Sacramento A's, kiss my A's. Uh, just <laughs> worth noting. Um, but yeah, we had a back and forth. We're, we're entering this episode. Thomas Carinante, it's been a while since we had to do one of these. We're entering this episode. I had somebody on Twitter yesterday just screaming at me saying, so predictable. When I was like, what was predictable? Losing eventually. They're like, you just don't get it, man. You don't get it. They had, <laughs> they had to win this game. Had to. And I responded, why? And the person went away. So they they didn't have to win that game. No. Squandered away a two-run lead in extras. It felt like a game they were not going to win until about a 16-minute period where they had hope. Thanks to Anthony Volpe and some late – thunder and uh some good work in the top of the 10th but then they fumbled away a scoring opportunity at the top of the did you really feel good entering the bottom of the 10th with jose ramirez up as the tying run leading off the inning i certainly didn't feel like all right book it that's a win i felt like okay gonna have to survive against the heart of the order with caleb ferguson on the mound and the tying run at the plate every time a batter comes up this half inning we'll talk about the whole series It's not our fault that the last game kind of dominates the discourse because it was the most recent one. It's what we saw. It wasted our Sunday. You used your time on Masters, final Masters Sunday to watch that. Uh, I did. I sure did. I watched the Knicks punch the two seed and then I watched the Yankees. Uh, So it was a bummer. But Thomas Carinante, welcome. You got an offer uh, for the folks before we can get into the highs and lows the weekend. And remember, there were more highs than lows. The lows were just pretty fuzzy. Don't forget about the highs, folks, and we are high right now on DraftKings. Uh, DraftKings is off. Is that what they wanted us to say, by the way? Did DraftKings say make sure to mention that you're we gonna we, get... you feel high on our <laughs> Are we going to get sued now? Yeah, I think um, we are. Yeah. Uh, DraftKings offering a fantastic sign-up bonus for new users. Um, new customers can place a $5 bet on any sport to instantly claim $150 in bonus bets. All you got to do is sign up with our code YanksGoYard, the product. The best part is that you'll receive these bonus rewards even if the first bet loses. Doesn't matter what you bet on or what the outcome is. You got $150 in bonus bets coming your way using that code YanksGoYard, which not only gets you the bonuses, but it also directly supports the podcast. YanksGoYard.com. Your friends, Adam and Thomas. Be generous. Have some fun. We're trying to hook you up. Hook us up. If you've been considering signing up for DraftKings, please make sure to use that code YanksGoYard to maximize your first bets. In addition to any of the other offers that they will send you, On a daily basis, Um, this offer is only available to new customers who are 21 and older and physically present in legal gambling states. Please remember to always gamble responsibly. Check the episode description for full terms of the offer to see if you qualify. Hint, you probably qualify. Anyway, um, yeah, this goes back to like 2021 days where the Yankees won 90 plus games, but they were losing all the wrong ones um, in terms of like, dropping a series finale in a in a heartbreaking fashion or uh blowing uh the series opener in a heartbreaking fashion and we were always on the podcast for 
all the bad ones. Mm -hmm. Nothing we could do about it. But I will assure you that this season is nothing like 2021, at least from the early returns. Um, and secondly, these losses happen. It's just in the context with which they happen, right? So last year's Yankees. If last year's Yankees lose this game early in the season and they are eight and seven, eight and eight, we're probably mm -hmm. like, what are you doing, man? Cut the bullshit. Like, why is this happening? Why are we having defensive gaffes to this magnitude at this rate when we need a win? Why are we having these bullpen problems, uh, you know, ad nauseum? Everything gets highlighted. However, when you are 12 and four, uh, these losses are acceptable. 162 game season, you are going to lose games that suck. This game objectively sucked. Sucked. This, this game was not lined up for the Yankees to win, in my opinion. Even after the even after the um, Rizzo clutch hit and extras, you felt like you needed another run there, and that's that's life with the new extra innings rules, man. You get that runner on second, it changes the entire complexion. One swing of the bat. If you score two runs in the first half of the inning, one swing of the bat ties the game in the bottom half of the inning. So, and at that point, usually you're in the depths of the bullpen because you're trying to, you're clinging on to whatever lead or whatever close game it is in inning seven through nine, which was the case here. Mm -hmm. um, this is going to happen. I'm glad that it happened after they had already won the series. I'm glad that mm -hmm. it happened. In fact, you know, that they're 12 and four, whatever games they've dropped this year have kind of been a little bit crushing, but in the grand scheme of things, not a big deal. You are not going to win all these games. None of these are must-win games, especially with the position that the Yankees put themselves in starting the year six and one. Um, so yeah, like like the like the person who went away on Twitter yesterday when you said uh why do they need to win this game? Um, I know our podcast is titled differently because we have a lot yeah. of things to talk about, but we are not angry. Uh, we would like some answers, we'd like to evaluate some things, we'd like to make sure that the problems that are happening right now in these losses that look particularly heartbreaking don't persist. But again, 12 and four, great spot to be series against division rivals coming up, but we got to put a bow on this one first. Yeah. Two plainly worrisome things yesterday that we'll highlight that I think should be looked at as long-term concerns. Not that you can say, remember that game against the guardians in April. Yeah. That's the reason why they lost, you know, yes yeah. or whatever, but there are a couple things that raised their heads in this series that did make you cock your eyebrow and go, oh, oh, right, they can't do that thing, really, and so they're going to need to keep an eye on that as the trade deadline approaches. I also want to be fair to the rest of the series because, again, sweeping a doubleheader, not easy. Sweeping a doubleheader against a team that entered this series 9-3 and three to your 10-3, and three, and you're coming onto their turf to play this game, uh, it's not you, – you assume a split in the doubleheader at best, and you think – it's. I would say it's Always. more likely – I think it's more likely Cleveland sweeps a doubleheader than we do, yes. especially with a, a six starter coming up from the minors to make that evening start. The way Cleveland has pitched so far this year, it's a bit of a house of cards. And <laughs> I'll be talking about this on Baseball Insiders later. You look at the pitchers that Cleveland is sending to Boston in this four-game series, and you go, how could this possibly continue with the way that offense operates, single, double, single, single, rather than home runs? Plus, starting pitching looking kind of deficient when you see it all lined up. Not not typical Guardians-level starting pitching. But still, entering this series, it feels way more likely that the Yankees lose both the first two and have to salvage Sunday rather than win the first two. They saved us from a much more toxic conversation today. That yes. said, you know what I fucking hate? Yes. When, when an incredibly clutch moment that you want to highlight and say is just like a, a cause for resounding success – Makes a loss even worse. So they lose that game 5-4 yesterday on the Floreal home run, the most predictable moment of the season oh. so far. I give that guy credit, Mr. Predictable, a predictable loss. Yesterday was a predictable way for the Yankees to lose a game. Giving up that home run to break the tie, pinch hit, Esteban Floreal against Luke Weaver throwing a fastball, the That's only it. thing Floreal can hit. That was terrible. <laughs> uh, but if they go down 5-4, we're not doing it. We have like one thing to fixate on yesterday, or two. Because uh, we'll talk about Anthony Rizzo. So if they lose that game 5-4 and the best closer in baseball comes in and blows them away, then we just have a pretty short examination podcast. We probably mostly talk about the first two wins. And then we say, yep, can't throw fastballs to Floreal there. Rizzo has to tighten it up on D. Maybe it's the concussion talking. I don't like what I see from him. But overall, very pleased. But instead, because of something great, because of Anthony Volpe taking a 101-mile-an-hour cutter into the gap to score Oswaldo Cabrera from first with two outs in the ninth, we have to talk about a loss that compounded and felt gross. 
and felt like one of the worst individual losses you can have because it was. It did hurt. It was a bad loss. It's not a can't lose that loss. They didn't blow an 8 nothing lead to the Red Sox. This wasn't game 162. This wasn't the playoffs. This is, it was about as it was 80% as bad of a regular season loss as you can have, for sure, I would say. And if I'm putting on my worst guy hat, if I'm being the worst guy, I am saying, hey, you know what? Kind of reminds me of that time that the Yankees were like 61 and and 22 and running away with the East. And then Judge doubled in extras in Boston. Rizzo doubled in extras in Boston. And you're like, how many more runs can they get? And then Rizzo stole third and got caught stealing. And you're like, oh, that didn't feel good. And then bottom of the 10th, Wandy Peralt trying to protect that two-run lead. New nope. friend Alex Verdugo singles in two runs. And from that point, they kind of lose grip on the AL East. That season starts to feel a little different. They somehow don't even get to 100 wins when it kind of felt like they might challenge for 110, 112 at some point. Um, that was the middle of July. This is April 14th. So I am not going to say that. I'm not going to compare two no. disparate years with different rosters, but similarly ugly feeling loss. And right down to the top of the 10th where they've got runners on second and third and one out. And like you said, you need more here. Just need it. You need more here. Uh, and what do they do? They managed to ground into a double play with second and third and one out. Verdugo doesn't run hard to first. I don't even totally blame him because he didn't not run hard. He like skipped and looked back. And overall, it was ugly, but it's something you never see. And you do have to blame Verdugo for that. I can't say, oh, no. absolve Verdugo of blame. He had no idea. He doesn't know he's on a baseball field. No, he does. He should be locked in. He should be running hard at all times. It wasn't just that he gave up on the play, that we looked back, stumbled, whatever. But you, you cannot ground into a double play. You honestly shouldn't be physically able to ground into a double play with second and third one out. They managed to. They somehow managed to. And that remind Anthony Rizzo stealing third at Fenway, grinding into a double play with second and third one okay. out. And not okay. to mention first and second no outs for Glaber Torres. Prime opportunity for him to wake up a little bit. And he goes ahead and bunts. Like, this for me is, we might as well start with the moment we pooped our pants in this three-game set, because that was it for me. Uh, Ram Ramon Laureano's almost mm -hmm. home run double in the first game was definitely the moment we survived, where we almost did, but pulled back and didn't. The moment I did was Glaber bunting in extras, because I was that's just not him. That's how you know he's in his head. I I'm being told the bat will turn around at some point, but... You he think he did that without being told to? I don't know. It's just, it shows you where we're at with Glaber though, right? Like yeah. so untrustworthy with first and second and nobody else right now that it's like, all right, we can't wait for the stats to normalize. We got a bunt here because we don't trust him. And that compounded in the bottom of the inning when he got a hot shot grounder, could have been, should have been the second out of the inning and instead was fumbled to the ground. He almost got Josh Naylor anyway after dropping it twice. Yeah. So it's just, it's, it's one big moment for me with Glaber. He's not mentally there. I would say, despite having a best friend in Juan Soto on the team, despite having incredible vibes on the rest of the roster, he can't get locked in on this season. And I'm not going to absolve Volpe of dropping the double play ball. No, no and way. I'm not going to absolve Rizzo of a million errors over the course of the season. And yesterday, the defense was shoddy. Really crazy. They, they win that game. If Volpe makes that play, they win no. that game. If Glaber makes that play, but it's impossible to sit here and say Glaber hasn't been more of a deficiency than Volpe so far, who's got all red on his Avant page, is hitting 380 and made the tie game happen yesterday by taking a 101 mile an hour cutter into the right center gap. He's been exemplary. Glaber's been awful. So both are to blame for yesterday, but Glaber is more worrisome long term. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, you know, those moments were obviously tough. I had a good moment of pooping my pants um, when Judge hit that fucking homer. I was watching it. Um, uh, and, uh, when he turned on that and it just sailed into the air, I was like, Oh, and I was screaming and everyone in my house was like, what's happening. I was like, judge bomb. It went so far. And they're like, shut up. Um, and I, you know, we haven't seen a home run like that from judge this year. That was more vintage Aaron judge than anything. So maybe at the very least, I know there's been some concerns with him because of the slow start and the potential, you know, the, the belief that there might be something going on, injuries behind closed doors that we're not being uh, informed of. Mm. Um, that was a good sign. That was that was a quintessential Aaron Judge swing, went out for a homer. So, I mean, I was trying to take the positives out of that. In terms of Glaber Torres and, um, and uh, Volpe, yeah, I mean, Volpe's defense has been a little bit suspect. He's had a couple of really bad throws to first, 
couple of bobbles of exchanges too. The two Labor times Day. they've taken a two run lead in extra innings this year, he's given it away specifically. Yeah. I don't want to, you know, again, I'm not focusing the laser on Anthony Volpe, but no. it's a fact. They had two, yeah. two run leads in extra innings this year. They went one and one in those games. And in both of those games, they got tighter because Anthony Volpe made a defensive miscue. Yeah. And it's worth talking about because middle infield defense is going to be the most important down the stretch in the postseason. And, um, there were some reservations about Volpe's defense last year, especially like with his arm strength, he won the gold glove. So I think that like maybe quieted some concerns a little bit artificially because you're like, Oh, he won the gold glove. Who gives a shit? And it's like, yeah, but gold glove, not entirely a legit voting process. I think we've come to discover over the last few years. Um, and uh, if you watched a lot of Anthony Volpe's play, you would know that there's room for growth. Still very good. Great player. Um, this start for, for, um, 2024 has been incredible, exactly what he's needed to kind of springboard after, um, I would say, a relatively disappointing rookie season. But you have to talk about the defense, especially when it's costing the team games. Glaber Torres is much more of a critical discussion because he's he's been in the league for much longer than Anthony Volpe has. He's made every sort of defensive gaffe, whether physically or mentally, you could ever imagine. Um, not only that, his bat's not there. Um, not only that there's, you know, the, the chatter before the season of him talking about how he wants to be a Yankee for life. And, you know, that's probably putting pressure on himself. And, you know, when there's any pressure on him, he typically doesn't perform well. Um, and again, you can love or hate Glaber Torres. I'm pretty much lukewarm on him, but the fact of the matter is, is he is not the same player that he was in 2018 and 2019. And that will define you. I don't care if he had a resurgent year last year with a 120 OPS plus, hit 20 something homers. Um, it was a lost season. It largely didn't matter. It's good for his ledger in terms of, you know, building his value and getting the contract that he wants. But those types of performances don't hold any weight when the season doesn't matter. He's performed admirably. Um, the last, you know, last year and half of what 2022 in seasons that ended up dooming the Yankees and looking particularly bad. Um, and in addition to that, like, Someone with that much experience should not be going through this type of stuff at the magnitude that he does. There should not be this many defensive lapses. The bat should not be this far behind at the beginning of the season, especially with all of the padding he has in the lineup. And I'm sick of the arguments with Yankee fans, right? It's either you're 100% pro Glaber or you've hated Glaber forever since he, you know, faltered in 2020, unable to take over the shortstop job. I'm somewhere in the middle. I can't stand when somebody's like Glaber's a liability and then somebody else is like, absolutely not. He's one of the most valuable players we have. It's no Glaber is a liability at times. So stop denying it when he's, he made two, he almost cost us the game. And what was it? The, he came the first real, game, first he came real close to costing us yeah. the first game. Again, the Yankees have been so on point this year for the most part that mm -hmm. they don't lose games unless they let the opponent back into the game. Yes. They, they've done that. Uh, you know, they got really unlucky in the game they lost to Miami. They uh, hit the ball really hard, rarely saw results, and took some bad ABs at the end of the game. And as Sal Licata likes to say, Juan Soto ruined the game by looking for a walk, uh, and he should go to hell, unfortunately. No, I mean, they, they lose that game, bad, bad at ball luck. They get bla – Nestor got blasted, and the bullpen got blasted by the Diamondbacks. They just kind of lost that game. But most of the games that have been up for grabs have been multi-run leads where the defense yeah. kicks a ball and lets the other team back into it. Blue Jays, Oswaldo Cabrera loads the bases by knocking a ball, loads the bases for Vlad Jr. Uh, Glaber in the opener. It's a 3 nothing game. The bases are loaded. Um, we have a chance to turn two to get out of it uh, and just gets chucked into the – force out at second, chucked into the stands, two-run score, and those are the only two runs the Guardians score in that game. The only reason they had to use the bullpen the way that they did was because of Glaber Torres' shoddy defense once they took a big lead. Yesterday, Anthony Rizzo gets bailed out a few times, but – the game, the game ends if either Volpe or Glaber yep. uh, manage to execute the, either one. Because, yep. uh, you know, Esteban Floreal, in what I've dubbed the least surprising moment of this entire series, obviously, right. goes yard at the end of that game. Then, uh, But if he doesn't do that, Class A doesn't come in. Volpe might not break the tie. None of those events occur in a sequence that I can conceivably say, oh, one happens and the other right. doesn't. Or they, they are reliant on each other. But they take that two-run lead. They run themselves out of a bigger inning, and you're already sort of feeling the bad vibes with the heart of the order coming up for, yeah. for Cleveland. Uh, but regardless, 
Vol- hot shot by Naylor. Glaber makes a great sliding play. Great feed to Volpe. If he gets the ball cleanly, they get Naylor at first by three steps. It's a double play. 7-6. David Fry hits a double. Next batter grounds out to Glaber because the infield's playing back. Game over. Uh, Glaber, even with the infield in, after the Volpe miscue, he makes that play. Naylor seemed to, they showed on the replay, be breaking for home right on contact. That means he's out with a good throw by five feet. He should yeah. not have done that. He would have been hosed. Glaber almost hosed him again after fumbling it, picking it up, dropping it again, picking it up, throwing to the plate. They were he well swiped and missed him on the tag by quarter of a second. Yeah. So Glaber makes a clean play there. They get the out, and then the sack fly that follows is just a fly out. They win the game. Uh, I am going to throw blame on on two on two parties here though. Blame because the, in, the infield defense is the glaring problem. Glaber, Volpe, DJ LeMahieu, not exactly a vacuum cleaner at third base either, by the way. So when he comes back, that doesn't, without John Birdie, that problem's not solved. Anthony Rizzo, post-concussion, we know his reaction time was dulled last year. He's hit well so far this year. <coughs> he has fielded extremely poorly. And sometimes he's put in position to help out Anthony Volpe with a scoop, and he can't do it. Volpe is still throwing to a version of Anthony Rizzo that I'm not sure if he exists anymore. And a lot of people are just saying he's washed. He, he's not washed. He was a, a an 11 home run top five first baseman in baseball in mid-May last year. Then Fernando Tatis Jr. didn't know how to get back to the bag and need him in the head. And then he played through a concussion for several months. And he's come back this year. And at the plate, he doesn't look much different. And in the field, he definitely does. Yeah. And I don't know how you can't blame that on the impact last year. So that's issue number one. Issue number two, which we have touched on in the past with Clay Holmes and extra innings, right? Saying, hey, I don't know if, you know, runner on second, I don't know if we need a ground ball guy in there right now. <clears throat> Maybe you'd be better served walking somebody, etc." The Yankees don't have strikeouts in the pen right now. And they're missing Loisaga for the year. And they're mm-hmm. missing Kinley and Efros and Lou Trevino for right now. But I don't know if any of those guys are coming back. 28th best pen in the league in terms of strikeout percentage right now. And they've been performing well overall so far. Yeah. <laughs> but their best K guy is Nick Birdie. They brought him in as a fireman yesterday, and he did the job with 99 on the black. We don't know how much longer Nick Birdie's going to be here. Career injuries have overcome him. I-, I absolutely cannot say with any certainty that Nick Birdie is active and available in mid-May. So you need more strikeouts. Caleb Ferguson, very good reliever. Probably better same side than righty lefty against Josh Ramirez and Naylor in extras. Even though the infield defense blew it, that's that's just not it. And, and Jose Ramirez dictated that opinion from the beginning. From the beginning, that at bat, he dictated the AB. That's gonna happen, you, of course. But Jose Ramirez was not going to. There was no way Caleb Ferguson was going to get him to swing and miss at a single pitch. Yeah, no chance. Just, yeah. Uh, and so you look at the league average in terms of inducing strikeouts, 22.6%. Ian Hamilton is the only full-time guy who approaches that. He's below it. He's at 22.3%. Holmes is in the 17s. The, that's not what the Yankees bullpen does. Victor Gonzalez is at 8% right now. So you can hold on. You, they've kind of put together a bullpen that is going to get a lot out of a lot of bend, don't break games, and hopefully they keep inducing soft contact. But Bullpen that gives up contact plus infield defense that's having problems is not necessarily a winning recipe. And the bullpen wish list should be long. And it should include a lot of guys who throw very hard who have swing and missed up this deadline. Unless Canely comes back and looks like the best version of himself, unless Efros comes back and the sweeper is disgusting, you're still going to need another guy because they don't have it right now. Yeah, I'm not. It's... Uh, this otherwise wouldn't be a discussion if the defense was a little bit tighter. I don't know how either Volpe's botched exchange or Glaber's botched exchange were not ruled errors. Did you, I don't know if you noticed that they were both ruled fielders' choices. I don't know in, on what planet those are those are ruled fielders' choices. Those are those were both outs. Um, especially if you're looking at the way that they that the Guardians turned to the inning prior. I don't know who was their first baseman. I, I didn't even look. Um, this it's is a, Naylor. This is a weird team. Yeah, it's, it's Josh Naylor. No, it was Fry yesterday. All right, all right, yeah. Fry, what's his first name? David Fry, someone who's David Fry. Sports, yeah, yeah. Fielded the ball, rock. He had to make a perfect throw to, to the catcher. He did. It was a bang bang play, and then you know Verdugo hesitated on that. Like you said, I think it was because he thought the ball was going to get rifled into his face, but. 
if you make a good throw there, you get an out. I don't know how that uh, on what planet that's not an error. If you if you mishandle a ball in the field and don't get it to first base in time, that's an error. This time it's just a fielder's choice because uh, technically Glaber could have went to another base. Like I don't understand how that that makes any sense. Um, but yeah, you would suspect that uh, the defense would be fine if the bullpen is putting balls on the ground, but right now it's not. And then you look at the 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 extremes of it, right? Barely any strikeouts. If you were like middle of the pack sitting there, you're like, okay, there's room to improve. Like we're striking out some batters. We're not testing the defense at every turn, but they are testing the defense at every turn. And in these bigger opportunities, it's going to matter as the season goes on. What I'm thankful for at least is that this is – maybe getting out of the way early, the strikeout issue, getting out of the way early. They're taking note of that. They maybe put guys in different spots. They know that they have reinforcements on the way on the flip side, defense getting tested a little bit early, kind of know where they have to lock down. Um, either way, I, I will say that you're right. This is, this is concerning because this is not the Yankees bullpen has not been built on this. It's been built on overpowering hitters, getting a ton of strikeouts as evidenced by how many of the acquisitions they've made over the last four or five years. Um, so you look at these other guys who are, you know, Caleb Ferguson, again, good reliever, but the guy coming in after homes and extras, like, do I think he's going to fail? No, but is the likelihood of him failing versus, you know, if we had a full strength bullpen or the guys that we had predicted would be in the high leverage spots. Yeah. So that's why you have to be extra careful. And that's why in these situations, uh, defense is the most important and swings and misses are the most important. Um, not concerned though, not concerned. It's good that we're diagnosing the problems. And I think that's what we're here to talk about. Yeah, I think so too. Um, you should, let's go positive. Uh, yeah. cause again, they won the series. So, uh, you, you can't talk about the series without focusing on the things that went wrong. It led to the house of cards falling apart yesterday. And, and that's again, if not for the great Volpe double, we're just talking about a game that's like, all right. Yeah. I mean, Rizzo is a little sloppy, not the best, you know, not the best effort after winning the series. Floreal got lucky. We only see him three more times this year in the regular season. Clean it up next time. And at least, you know, and you'll also be like, ah, and, and now Cleveland has to go to Boston for four. At least they enter that series kind of hot. That's fun. Uh, but instead we have to talk about what sounds like just a disaster of a game because of the last 30 minutes. Uh, when they go ahead and steal one and then get it stolen back from them because they kind of give it away a little bit. But earlier in the series, Saturday night, Cody Poteet is the moment I was happiest in this series. I mean, the yeah. judge home run is is real close. So good. Soured my vibes a little bit just because, again, now I'm remembering the great Aaron Judge home run and Jose Trevidio going deep in a game they ultimately didn't win. Same with the Volpe double, but... Cody Poteet coming up from the minors. Be honest, like your expectations before this game, he had put up two good short starts in the minors earlier this year. So like I'm thinking Guardians offense isn't overwhelming. Jose Ramirez could maybe just tags him. Maybe Naylor gets him. Maybe like two runs and four innings. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Like, hey, best case mm -hmm. gives us like 60 pitches and in four innings, four or five hits, two runs. You, I would call that a success. I'd say they gave the Yankees a chance with their current offense. Uh, six innings, almost effortless. Six strikeouts, 77 pitches from someone who goes right back down to the minors. But if you needed a reason to believe in the depth in the starting pitching department, Clark Schmidt working around five walks was fantastic otherwise. Yeah. Uh, and then Cody Poteet with just like an Aaron Small-esque summoning from the minors, like just – he could have got 77 pitches if he's built up a little. He could have gone. He could have gone eight shutout. Yeah. If he hadn't gotten victimized, uh, who went yard first? Floreal. Well, yeah, yeah. Floreal yep. went yard first. So if he has, he doesn't give up that home run to a guy who's now our number one enemy, and and he's on a different pitch count and pitch restriction. He goes at least seven one run innings in what amounts to his reintroduction to Major League Baseball. I mean, that was incredible. It absolutely was. That was, it was good to know we have that type of depth too. Obviously we don't know if it's going to stand and that's going to be consistent, but we know the capability is there. Not many guys come in in that, in that situation and just rip across, you know, six innings like that. Um, my uh, surprising moment was um, Oswaldo's home run. How many fucking days did he have off? Two, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. He had five days off. He didn't play a single game in the Marlins series. Friday gets rained out. 
So he's ice cold. This game, too, the first game of this series, the day game on Saturday, it was shaping up to be one of those Yankees classics. Traffic on the bases, the first fucking five innings, you only get one run across on a double play, and you're like, great. Every inning we've either had a couple of hits or we notched a couple of walks, and now we have one run to show for it, and now just wait for it. Eighth inning, we are going to get burned, and you're going to hate yourself. Oswaldo, two-run homer in the sixth, which, you know, after all that traffic on the bases, you're like, this team only got three runs on the day, but two-run shot makes it 3 nothing. Yankees hold on to win 3-2. The fact that he was able to come into the series – and produced the match. I think he contributed a run every game. It was either RBI or he went that game. He hit the two run homer. Um, yesterday he scored a run. He ripped and, a double in the night game on Saturday yeah, too. The RBI double in the night game on Saturday. So it wasn't the prettiest. I mean, he got. I I think he got three hits on the day and what is it, three for thirteen or whatever. But contributed meaningfully and knock the rust off because he should not have been on the bench for as long as he was. And it wasn't fair to him either with the manner in which he was playing to start the season. Another frustrating thing where it's like the Yankees. Yes. I understand there were all lefties in the Marlin series, but you are punishing good performance for no reason. Very annoying um, to see that, but I'm very glad that he was able to remain resilient and actually, you know, contribute meaningfully and help the Yankees win. Agreed, and you're a hundred percent right about the Yankees classic stat. If, if that guy wanted to tweet at me again that this was classic and predictable, he should have done that midway through the yes. first game on Saturday because that was we asked for Trent Grisham to get reps, and Trent Grisham showed up and was like, "All right, I actually want fewer reps because I suck." <laughs> uh, my God, like you, one double play with the bases loaded, great. I'm already like going to be critical of your yeah. appearance. Uh, two is un- unbelievable. So. Uh, he clearly did need more reps earlier in the month. Maybe that would have changed mm-hmm. things. If you throw him back in the fire and he's just got nothing for you, as Jeff Probst yeah. likes to say. Uh, but I'm going to go with Cody Poteet just because uh, that the difference to. between the difference between winning the late game Saturday yep. and not being and just going down softly and then looking awful in the rubber game on Sunday. And we're <laughs> we were already negative for like 25 minutes. Imagine how negative we would have been if they lost that series the way that they <laughs> did. Um, Anything else you want to touch on before we do a little preview of the Jays series? Um, do I want to touch on this? I was just splitting the stats. Uh, yeah, you know what? I'll touch on this. Runners at scoring position again. First two games. First two games. They won the first two games. What'd they go with runners in scoring position? Six for 26. Mm-hmm. It's just not good enough. I mean... I'm glad they won the game, but again, this is another problem. This is you talk about the defense, not shitting my pants yet. Talk about the offense. I'm totally fine with it. But what happens in the postseason? The postseason down the stretch against divisional opponents, close games, what have you, especially now with this bullpen. I don't know how much the Yankees can realistically improve their bullpen between now and post trade deadline. Obviously, guys might come avail uh, become available, but you don't know. Um, payroll situations a little bit wonky so i don't know how much they'll be able to add in terms of higher you know bigger names and then it becomes the balancing act it's like okay am i gonna acquire a big name reliever with a large salary and pay double the money because of the tax or am i gonna go after a controllable reliever and surrender more assets so you talk about that problem potentially being you know more glaring as as the season goes on i know they went three for six with runners in scoring position yesterday which was encouraging but Funny enough, that's the loss. You go three for six with Risp, and that's the loss. You go six for 26 in the other two games. Those are wins. This is where I just don't want the conversation being ignored because you can look at yesterday and be like, oh, well, they did fine with runners in scoring position. Or, oh, they won the two games where they sucked with runners in scoring position. Marlins series, they batted 192 with runners in scoring position. Again, won two of the games, but can't not talk about it because this was a, this was arguably the biggest problem with this team over the, over the last three, four years, runners in scoring position. Um, so don't want to get negative, but again, it happened again. That's all I'm saying. It happened again. There were some sort of impossible, so there, even in the game that they won on Saturday night, there were some where yeah. they, they had chances to add on. It was second and third, nobody out at one point. And I was like, okay, great. And pick up another few runs. Great. You look at the, out a run here. Yeah. You look at the board and you go, oh, they didn't, put up any runs in that inning oh, that's weird and it's right after the Florial home run too and you're like they're probably not going to blow an 8-1 lead here but <laughs> i'd like it to be 10-1 and i'm confused that it's not like we couldn't have 
going to inch those runs across the board. That's odd. Um, a little bit more comfort for everybody, too. If you're thinking, if you haven't been watching the Los Angeles Dodgers and you think that the Yankees are the only team with a bullpen that we're like, hey, could be improved, could be improved. Yeah. The Yankees are the second best ERA in baseball overall yeah. entering play today. Uh, the Red Sox were ahead of them. I don't know if they still are after being blanked 6 nothing, but they probably are. Uh, Yanks and Red Sox are the top two ERAs in baseball, which is crazy. Uh, but here's the Dodgers so far. The powerhouse Dodgers, the unfair Dodgers. Uh, 19th in MLB in team ERA, 4.28. 21st in bullpen ERA, 4.69. Fourth worst in the league. It's 65 walks. That's ugly. That's more of a problem. Yeah. That's more of a problem than what the Yankees are putting up so far. Um, so you, you also want to give some credit, I think. Uh, Soto, credit, Stanton. Credit, credit corner to Giancarlo Stanton a little bit. And I think yeah. he it. We, I feel like we didn't talk about it that much um, after the Marlins series just because it was, you know, the conversation had shifted to other nonsense. But, yep, batting 250 with an 829 OPS, got uh, – an RBI in the first, he sat one of the doubleheader games, which was obviously the move. I don't know why. You have he to do that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Why wouldn't he sit the second game? Why would he play a night game into a day game? I don't know. Either way, RBI um, in that one with the bases loaded walk. And then goes two for five yesterday with, um, he only struck out twice in the series in 10 plate appearances. To me, that's improvement. Um, after, you know, you're coming off the heels of the, uh, the Blue Jays and Marlins series where he, fully resurrected himself heading into the um, Blue Jays series or the second game of the Blue Jays series. He was betting 125 with a 452 OPS. Again, very small sample size. This is subject to fluctuate drastically, but man, if we can get a 250, eight plus 850 OPS season from Giancarlo Santon, that will be fucking massive. And that's not even asking for a lot because his career averages are like 260, 875 or were before like, were before he arrived here, um, or were, were, it was a little bit better than that. But either way, just you know, get some hits, get the ball in play, hit some homers. Like, just can't have these disastrous zero for four three K days where like you're getting overmatched by like a ninety four mile an hour fastball. We can't have that. Um, and then Soto's homer, holy shit, that was so badass. Yeah, that was so <laughs> badass. Oh my god, um, three zero pitch too. Like, yeah, hey, Mister, light, fuck you. Mr. Looking for walks. Like, hey, you want to throw me a fastball? 3 0 yeah. with two outs and two on. All right, great. Not looking for walks. Like, <laughs> can, uh, I don't remember how much we did on Salicata. Probably too much. He did a bit. Didn't deserve any more than we did. But I don't understand, like, the the, uh, the audacity to be like, yeah, he should swing it at bullshit. Like, with, with two on and two out as a tying run, instead of passing the baton to Aaron Judge, who, by the way, right now has an OPS over 800 again after a good series in Cleveland. He's climbing again. And even if he didn't, it's Aaron Judge. If he can't, if Aaron Judge can't handle himself in early April, then, like, that's nobody's fault except Aaron Judge. It's not Juan Soto's fault for you, but you have to protect him. Got himself to a full count and then had a terrible pitch. And went, yeah. okay, great. Can't swing at that. I'm gonna walk. Like <laughs> I, I can't I can't deal with that. But in case you needed a, a fuck you like two days after, you got it. Because he got a 3-0 pitch, worked the count in his favor, got a mistake down the middle, launched it to dead center from Tristan McKenzie, who knew exactly what he'd given up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another just like wandering forward, kind of almost skipping off the mound, like, well, Juan Soto kicked my ass. That's interesting. Um, another future potential Yankee who is so far, the early returns against the Yankees, not promising. Like, I got my eye on Tristan McKenzie as a deadline candidate. Yeah. You got to keep your eye on the whole Guardians team unless they keep, you know, stay red hot. They mm -hmm. shut out the Red Sox today. Good for them. Um, but, yeah, Jesus Lozardo, Tanner Scott got destroyed by Marcelo Zuna after taking 40 pitches to retire the Yankees or whatever. Haven't been impressed with a lot of these names. I think Tanner Scott's still a guy they need to try to get their hands on if they can because the price is not mm. going to be prohibitive. Yeah. Uh, and I think if you can get somebody, you want to talk about swing and miss out of the bullpen. He struck out a hundred plus guys last year in 78 innings, get him Matt Blake and get him Matt Blake early, get him Matt Blake in May. So the Matt Blake can say, okay, uh, June, July, we're going to be working on this. So August, September, you're the best version of yourself instead of getting him on August 1st and being like, well, I guess we have to rely on this guy who walks everybody now, get him <laughs> earlier Give up your 28th best prospect, an FCL guy, trade with the Marlins again after the John Birdie deal, uh, who, uh, yeah, again, is sadly on the IL. It's a groin strain. He'll be he'll be okay. For now, the Yankees bench is quite bad.
not entirely their fault. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that was another tough one. That was another guy I had my eye on just getting manhandled. But you start veering into there was a Twitter argument the other day that was cool. like. The Yankees haven't played anybody yet. Look at the records of the teams the Yankees have played. And a bunch of smart Yankees fans were like, the Yankees kicked those teams' asses. Yeah. That's why their records are bad. Because the Yankees came in and beat them all. So it's almost the same thing. Like, man, these trade targets look bad against the Yankees. It's because the Yankees might be good. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to me about records in July. And also, again, conversation earlier. The 2018 Red Sox, the reason they won 108 games is because they beat the ever-loving piss out of all the bad teams. And all we talk about at the end of the year is, did you win the games you were supposed to win? And then mm-hmm. all that matters is how you perform mm-hmm. when the postseason arrives. So shut up. Yeah. They didn't take Alex Cora's win wall away because too many yeah. of the wins were against the Too Royals. many of the wins were the Orioles. They went 17-2 yeah. and two against the fucking Orioles. Yeah, sorry. You got to take – no, you can't brag about those. Now the Orioles have gotten their revenge pretty nicely. So yes. that's fun. Um, that's just – an. I'm sure later in the year I'm going to wish that the Red Sox had taken one off the Orioles, but I, ju- I can't do it. I'm sorry. Not now. I wish I could. I wish I could. I wish I was a strong enough man to be like, hmm, it might benefit me in September if the Baltimore Orioles could lose a game or two now. Nope. I want <laughs> the Red Sox to lose every game they play. Sorry. Feel bad. Don't feel bad. Um, that goes with the Blue Jays, too. I also would like the Blue Jays to lose Eight every game they play. Blue Jays. Uh, and here they come. Uh, we go to Toronto, a place where we've played worse against the Jays than in Yankee Stadium. No, not really. We actually play them better here. Uh, Vlad's house, Aaron Judge, side-eye glances at the dugout, uh, Yankees beating up on Robbie Ray at the end of the 2020 one, one season to keep the Blue Jays out of the playoffs, I believe. Yeah, because that was the year Cole didn't win the Cy Young, right? Uh, well, that, was a, that was a fun one either way. That was 2021, right? All these yeah. years do sort of start to blend together a little bit. Yeah, because then Ray went to Seattle and then – had Tommy John. Yeah. And in 2021, that was when you briefly felt good about things because they beat up that they had to play the Red Sox at Fenway, the Jays in Toronto, yeah. and then the Rays at home. And of course, they take care of business in the first two. And you're like, oh, maybe I was wrong about the 2021 Ooh. Yankees. And then they literally go down to the wire and making the postseason in the Rays series. They almost fumble that bag. But they've had some they've had some moments where they've been able to dance on the Blue Jays graves a little bit. And this series, the pitching matchups are very interesting. You got uh, you're going to get Luis Heel in this opener because he was not used in the previous game in relief. I like that. I like that they like reserved that. him a little bit. Chris Bassett has struggled so far this year, but he's always a tough matchup. Yep. Kind, of, kind of pitches like Cody Poteet a little bit. Uh, then tomorrow you've got Kikuchi again, who the Yankees could not solve in the home opener, and he will face Carlos Rodon, who three starts in, got to feel pretty good, especially after that third one. And uh, then it's Marcus Stroman once more coming off kind of a bad one against Kevin Gossman, who had shoulder fatigue in spring training and has come back this year throwing like four miles an hour softer and has not looked like himself at all. So, like, is he going to get back after it? At some point, absolutely. Um, Before surgical intervention? I don't know. This is not Kevin Gossman right now. So you've got a chance to really take advantage of him this week and win another series. I think you have a golden chance to win your sixth straight series to start the year. Mm -hmm. But if you mess around with the first two, and then Kevin Gossman has a chance to really – maybe he built up strength between starts. You don't know what he's going to look like. Uh, <clears throat> if he's himself, you, you, you could lose this series. Uh, but I, I do like how the matchups are laid out. I'm not uh, – there's nobody going in this series that I'm just like, well, chalk that one up. Don't feel good about it. Yankees don't really have anybody like that at all right now where I'm like, that guy on the mound, L. Nestor's the closest, and he just threw eight shutout against the Marlins. So, yeah. yeah think a good opportunity here is obviously it's early. We're not making any um, full season judgments or anything on Bassett or Gossman, but there's kind of an opportunity to maybe bury them a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. they're going into their fourth starts of the year. Like if you can rock one or both of them, whether you win the game or not, I think that's a huge win for the Yankees because you're just crushing their best pitchers. Morale, you know, in theory, at the top of the rotation is Gossman Bassett. I know it's changed with uh, uh, Berrios's emergence, but um, you got to play the mind game here. Got to kick them while they're down in some capacity. Um, I know the Jays have a little bit of momentum. Why? Because they beat the fucking Rockies two out of three games. Good job. Ain't that how it always happens? The Red Sox. Oh, Red Sox coming back. Like, oh, surprise. This is our year. Because they beat the A's and the Angels. Yeah. And the I Mariners just, who can't hit. They went 7-3 against three yeah. teams that can't hit. Okay. Yeah. 
the the Blue Jays lost the first game of the series against the Rockies like 12 to 4 or 12 to 3 or something. Yeah. They win the next two like 5 to 1 and 5 to 2. And then the headline I see on Sportsnet is Blue Jays coming into Yankee series with unique momentum. I don't know what's unique about it. I don't know what's good about it. First two game winning streak. Yeah. First first two game winning streak against a bottom three team. Okay, sure. Um, Look, the Jays are not a team to overlook. They have a ton of talent, but um, we will sit here and we will criticize them once again for their upgrades over the last two off seasons. They've done a complete dog shit job. Dalton Varsho is terrible. They subbed out Whit Merrifield and Brandon Belt with Isaiah Connor Falefa and Justin Turner. Justin Turner's worked out well so far, but um, don't a don't know how long that's going to last. B it's a player who's turning forty years old, so um, a hundred sixty two game season for him uh, is probably going to be a lot more difficult for you know than somebody who's twenty seven. Uh, I. Bo Bichette and Vladdy, to me, still leave a lot to be desired. They're both having really bad years, and they've kind of only regressed, in my opinion, since their monstrous debuts. Uh, so this team, again, doesn't scare me, never has scared me. Not going to overlook them, though. I do like to talk shit on them. I do like to have fun with it. Um, but we know they're a division rival. They know they. know I know they come to play us every time. This is their This is their favorite series to talk shit. This is their favorite series to win. Um, I like Stroman pitching against them again. I like how the the more uh, the more things that seem to be stacked up against Stroman, uh, I think the better he performs. He he likes to utilize the 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 chip on his shoulder, whether it's legitimate or not, um, which I do respect, especially in an opponent. Um, we get mad at the Red Sox kind of uh, manufacturing the uh, us against the world thing all the time, but it works. It fucking works. So guess what? Time for me to use it. I'm going to use it. Marcus Stroman, Blue Jays, um, because there's not really any animosity here. The the relationship just ended. He was traded, um, and he hasn't been there in four or five years. Um, So either way, I mean, look, I think if the offense continues doing what it's doing, I think if we can get to one of Bassett or Gossman, it's going to be a really good series for us. Um, People are saying sweep the Blue Jays. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I would love to, Roberto and Fernando. I'm not going to bank on it. Hmm. Sweeps are really hard. Uh, Sweeps are really hard on the road, and sweeps are really hard on the road against your divisional opponents. Um, I will be rooting for it, however. Um, I'm not going to be like uh, the Blue Jays homers, though. Be guarantee it. Write it on my gravestone. Blue Jay series sweep. The New York Yankees. Here we go. I'm not doing that. Um, we'll never do. You're never going to sound like that ever again. (laughs) But, um, I, I I like the opportunity here that we have to maybe set the blue Jays back a little bit because they have done nothing impressive so far this season outside of, I guess, beat the Rockies. What else have they done? Nothing. Nothing. They got no hit by the Astros. They almost got two no hit by the Astros. Um, they dropped, they split the season series with the Rays, um, and got like uniquely rocked in two of those games. Um, and then they got beat by us. Mm-hmm. So what does it matter? Yeah, they weirdly seem to win almost every game. They start Davis Schneider, so let's also stop that streak. That would be great. Um, I feel good. I, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna predict two out of three. I'm not gonna predict yeah. a sweep. Uh, but I do That's think uh, I'm still. You know, yesterday did not change my viewpoint. I'm still excited to watch Yankee games so far. 2024. I'm not dreading any of these. I wish we didn't play the Blue Jays six times the first two weeks in April, though, and then probably yeah. never again until September. But, uh, yeah, give me a shot. You know, whoever – whatever, whoever led to that unique momentum and helped them beat the Rockies, we're not facing those starting pitchers. So uh, that's that. Uh, before we sign off, got to credit uh, Augustine Ramirez. Yeah. Can we? Uh, Worked on his launch angle this offseason, apparently. New York Daily News just published an article about him as well. Late. I published one over the weekend. No, just kidding. I mean, you guys obviously spoke to him and I didn't. But six home runs in eight games after working on that launch angle. And if you've watched the Augustin Ramirez highlights, you know why the Yankees protected him from the Rule 5 draft this offseason. I don't know how much longer Carlos Narvaez is going to be around on the 40-man roster. I don't know uh, specifically... Uh, ben Rordvet, like I'm not regretting allowing Ben Rordvet to go to Tampa, whatever. I certainly was not going to stand for carrying three catchers to start this year. Uh, but Ramirez needed to stay, and now he's here and is is making a note of it. Um, so congrats to him. I also uh, was at the MLB store over the weekend, did get to peep some of the merchandise. 
the new get? Yankee, the new Yankees jerseys and the new jerseys in general that fans can buy, like the cheaper version of the Nike jersey. Now I'm sure the authentics suck, but the hundred fifty dollar ones, they're not that bad. They're kind of higher quality than they used to be. Uh, and then they should be good. Yeah, they, they're pretty good. And then the, the Yankees jerseys overall, obviously, that's they the made stitched them. on look, right? Yeah, that's yeah. the thing. The replicas are stitched. They're not iron on. They're not horrible. Um, and then uh, the New York, the authentic jacket, the black jacket the players are wearing in the okay. dugout now with New York on the side in cursive. Uh, it's beautiful. Somebody mail it to me. Uh, I want it. Do I want to spend two hundred dollars on it? Yes, I do. Just not right now. But somebody could hand that. Somebody could just. Uh, Sponsors, fanatics. I love you guys. I just said nice things about the New Jersey. So we're in a fanatic um, set. If you want to ship me, uh, yeah, one specific product, that'd be great. I don't want a gift card. I just want that jacket. Yeah, I did just read something. I was stunned, Roberto. Um, I got to share it. But yeah, ship us the jackets first of all. That'd be nice. Um, secondly, I made a mistake on the headline from Sportsnet. It was Blue Jays carry some momentum into big series with the Yankees, which is almost worse. Yeah. What? Some momentum. A little bit. It's either like you have momentum or you fucking don't. Or you're, you know, it's either you're, you're just, you're completely flaccid. You're, 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 you're rolling full steam ahead or you're a bad team that is in need of a break. So some momentum does not qualify as anything. I don't know. I probably read unique in another headline. Anyway, even better, even better. Cause I hate the blue Jays and Chris Bassett pisses me off. What was the, he, he just says shit all the time. That pisses me off. He had the whole COVID thing with the Mets. Was that with, that was with him too. Yeah. Yeah. Saying nonsense. He was asked today before the series against the Yankees about um, the rise in pitching injuries. Cause the conversation has come up recently. Spencer Strider and Shane Bieber done for the year. Garrett Cole on the shelf. Garrett Cole was asked his opinion. Again, Garrett Cole was asked his opinion. If he is asked a question and states what and 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 has his take on it, I don't know why people are calling him a baby. It was it was like the whole Vogelback thing. It's like, how'd you feel about Daniel Vogelback homering off you and bat flipping? Um, kind of lame. Yeah, Great. I'll, okay. I'll remember well, that. This I mean, guy's yeah. a baby because he was asked a question. I'm about to flip flop on that though because Chris Bassett was asked a question about pitching injuries, and here's what he had to say. Quote, it makes me sick to watch the finger pointing on why all this is happening rather than everyone kind of take the blame for themselves. First and foremost, it is the players to blame for throwing the way that we're trying to throw. But for people to think that it's not the pitch clock, that's completely wrong. It is the pitch clock. Training wise, how we push people, it's that too. The much bigger issue is is because it's not a one factor thing. It's not like we take one thing away and this goes away. This is a cumulative problem. So so we have 10 weights we're trying to hold. All of a sudden, you take one away and it's going to go away. That's not the way it is. The way the guys train, how hard guys throw, and then you shorten the time frame of how you want people to do it. it it's cumulative and what's causing all this. First of all, you're going to blame players for throwing the way that they throw? We're supposed to now readapt how we have come to throw over the year? I mean, He's the only guy who throws like yeah. him, too. So he's basically saying, I actually figured it out. Yeah. Everybody should pitch like me, make me less unique and less effective, make everyone's arsenal look like Chris Bassett's, throw 88, and that will all somehow survive that. Yeah, good luck. Yeah, and secondly, we – look, I don't want to get into the weeds with this because I'm not a pitcher and I have not experienced the pitch clock and have felt rushed, but a study came out that showed the Tommy John elbow injuries were the same 10 years ago that they are – that they've been over the last two or three years – so clearly the pitch clock has not, you know, yet. I know we don't have definitive de data on it, but I don't know if it's caused all the problems at this moment. I would say the ball grip has probably caused more, more of that with guys coming out and saying, I have to grip harder. It's putting more tension on my forearm. You having to throw a pitch five seconds faster than you're used to, I don't think is contributing to a rise in Tommy John surgeries. There was a great Kenley Jansen quote on that too, that I want to get to make sure. I mean, it was basically, it was basically Kenley. Yeah, here you go. Kenley Jansen calls for MLB to revisit pitch clock quote, put your egos and pride aside. You put your ego aside. You're asking them to revisit the pitch clock because you can't pitch under the duress of the pitch clock. Yes. Your ego is dominating that conversation. You're saying, it used to be easier for me to pitch. Now I can't. 
It's the pitch clock's fault, but you need to put your ego aside and reevaluate this. No, Kenley, your ego is butting up against this as well. Sorry that your style isn't working so much in the modern game. Adapt, yeah. adjust. Yeah, I uh, I don't I don't like this. And it, you, it, you have the crazy camps too. Now it's like MLB saying, shut up, nothing's the problem. Players are saying, everything you're doing is what we have to blame. And now Bassett's saying, well, it's everybody's fault. Yeah. It's the pitch clock's fault, which – Data has not yet proven, and it's the pitcher's fault for throwing harder. Everybody but me. It's everyone's fault but Chris Bassett. <laughs> uh, I would – that said, maybe that the overall messaging of his quote here was that we all need to come together, mm -hmm. perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. So I will support that. But to blame the pitchers for how people have started throwing over the year – and I understand that's, that's a Major League Baseball problem too. I was talking about it the other day. It's like nowadays – you seem to can't it, – it seems like pitchers don't even get a look from MLB teams if you're not throwing 95-plus, mm -hmm. which is crazy because, like, Greg Maddox and Mike Messina wouldn't exist today in theory. Mm -hmm. Would that Like, they would be under-scouted or, you know, like, the, with the, I haven't seen – outside of what, like, Nestor Cortez, and he has a unique funky delivery that's kind of – Helped him, and he's a lefty. Being a lefty always helps no matter how fast you throw. But for right-handed pitchers, I feel like there's this weird – there's this weird, like, you're either you're either a flamethrower or you're not playing baseball. Um, and that does have to go with what kind of what Bassett's saying with it is – it is uh, the pitcher's fault. But in essence, it's MLB's fault because the way that they're scouting and the way that they're valuing players is forcing pitchers to change their style or else they won't have a fucking job. Right? Am I reading this correctly? I don't know. Yeah, I feel like that's, like, you know, we see with the Rays, the burn and churn Rays. Fucking, hey, can I get the next guy to throw 96? When he blows his arm out, we'll find another one. Don't you worry about it. So this is a, this is more of a systemic baseball issue than it is blame, you know, blaming the players. Um, you, It's adapt, you know, it's adapt or die, right? This league, it seems like a lot of the adaption has had to do with throwing harder or, you know, uh, uh changing your arsenal maybe you had maybe you were a really good th uh, you maybe you were a really solid solid three to four pitch pitcher and then they you know the disparity in velocity was enough so you had to just go to two two fastball slider that's the common it's common relief uh combo now and that's going to cause the most injuries because of the torque on your arm i don't know yeah anyway. and the ray is basically saying hey you could be a superstar we're going to give you an increase in mile per hour we're going to give you an increase in stuff you're going to be nasty and hopefully you make it to free agency because there's, <laughs> there's a chance that you don't. And you better hope you make it a free agency. Mark. Robert Stevenson just broke down a month after signing his contract. And the Rays are probably like, good job, dude. You held yeah. off. You, you did it. You made it. Because some of them are going to get to free agency and they're going to get $10 million a year. And some of them are like J.P. Fireisen, who, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't he start his Rays career with like 27 straight scoreless innings? Or he did whatnot? something insane. Yeah, and now all of a sudden has been, you know, injured, DFA'd, Dodger now, and he was the chief culprit in yesterday's game going off the rails, and right now he has a 40.50 ERA for the 2024 Los Angeles Dodgers. So you might not make it to free agency. In in 2022, Fire Eisen had a zero ERA in 24 and a third innings. Seven hits allowed, one run, none earned. But he missed 2023, Yankee. but he missed 2023, and now he's this. I remember we we were complaining about that because we had him and traded him for who? Oh, boy. No, we DFA'd his ass. Oh, boy. Him well, we Guardian. got him with Ben Heller, right, once upon a time in the in the Clint Frazier, Justice Sh in the in the 2017 trade deadline trade. He was a part of that, the Andrew Miller trade. Uh, but how did we get rid of him? We were probably very stupid. Um, went to the Guardians after I know we, that we or, traded it. We I'm traded sure. him to the Brewers for nobody. Brewers. We traded him to the Brewers probably after a DFA for somebody named Brenny Escanio. Uh, and then the Brewers traded him and Drew Rasmussen to the Rays for Willie Adamas and Trevor Richards. An insane four man trade full of people who I hate facing. All four of them. <laughs> Trevor Richards, we'll see, we'll see you tonight. You and your stupid same side changeups. I hate you. <laughs> I hate you, brother. Yeah. Oh, uh, man. Well, yep. 
Blue Jays tonight. Here we go. Best of luck to New York Yankees against these Jays. Not fun. Again, wish we could wait another month before we saw them again, but I guess it's now. So you might as well get Bassett and you might as well get Gossman while their numbers don't look quite so gaudy. We'll see you after this series back here on Thursday, 2 o'clock Eastern, to wrap it up and preview the next. The Yankees will return home after that. That's always nice. It's good to be home. Yeah. I'm Adam Weinrib. You can find me on Twister at Adam Weinrib, Thomas Carinante. Where can the people find you? I'm at Tommy's underscore takes. We are both at the official Yanks Go Yard Twitter account at Yanks Go Yard FS. Head on over to YanksGoYard.com. All the content is there. Yanks Go Yard is the code for a first time DraftKings user. If you want to cash in on those bonus bets, go ahead. Um, Yankees, enjoy the off day on Thursday because then it's 17 straight games up until May 5th. So that's life. You got to capitalize on at least at the very least this series before the gauntlet begins. Um, we know the lack of rest is a problem. It's going to tax the bullpen. It's going to tax everybody. You're going to see a bunch of Aaron Judge on Carlos Stanton off days in between. But here we go. This is what it's all about. This is what it's all about, by the way. This. Um, baseball being played and baseball being discussed. We'll see everybody back here on <laughs> Thursday on a nice little one-day break. Good, good to not have baseball on Thursday, I would say. Uh, we'll see how the series goes. We'll see everybody.